Welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and joining me today is Dale Brumfield. He is a cultural archaeologist who happens to know a lot about the history of both Virginia and the nation. And today we're going to be talking about the history of the modern gay rights movement. Thank you so much for being here, Dale. Thank you for having me, Catherine. So people who watch this show know that I sit on the board of Equality Virginia, and I have for about seven years. And this year, now that the legislative session has started, Equality Virginia is going to be uh, looking at a bill that will be introduced for the 10th year in a row that protects the employee employment of public employees from discrimination, and that is for members of the LGBTQ community. But there's actually a long history of discrimination, not just in Virginia, but in this country, of people either who identify as gay, but more particularly, anyone who's suspected of being gay. That's correct, absolutely. Um, I recently did some research on an executive order called 10450, which President Dwight Eisenhower instituted in 1953, in which uh, gays, sus people suspected of being gay who were federal employees, uh, could be fired. And many firings resulted as a result of that executive order. So this is a process that went all the way back to the early 1950s. Now, two years earlier in Los Angeles, a foundation started called the Mattachine Foundation. This was America's first organized gay rights movement. Uh, it was remarkable. A man named Harry Hay brought several people together and they started meeting. And their purpose was to uh, raise grassroots awareness of what gay rights were, that gays were not to be ostracized, but to uh, have their... The same rights as everyone else. The same rights as everyone else. And this yeah. is what we keep saying. It's not that, that, that people in this LGBTQ community want special rights. They just want the same rights. Just the same rights. They're and, not and that is to just, level the playing field. And that has been beyond their reach. <laughs> not just in employment, but here in Virginia, in housing and public accommodation as well. Right. But yeah. at the federal level, this was, like you said, it's an executive order. And the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, he had an unhealthy obsession with this. A very unhealthy obsession. In fact, when, when the Mattachine Foundation started in 51, by about 1953, their lawyer, he was a Russian immigrant, uh, I think, I can't remember his name offhand, but he had testified to the House Un-American Activities Committee on an, un, on an unrelated matter. But he was seen as being unfriendly to the anti-communist fight at the time, this started raising eyebrows, people saying, wait a minute, he's also representing this homosexual, they called him then sexual deviates. Right. They didn't use, even use the word homosexual. He's also representing these sexual deviates. He must be, we better take a look at them. And all of a sudden, this brought unwanted attention to the Mattachine Foundation in Los Angeles, and they immediately disbanded that particular type. And a new group came in, uh, who were a little more conservative, they decided, well, we're not going to go for the social activism of the former group. We're going to stress acceptance rather than activism. It was a much more uh, reserved and under the radar type of thing. One thing about the 1950s that people have to remember, yes, the American white middle class started in the 50s. It was post-war boom. America went from being an agricultural society to being a manufacturing society. But the 1950s were also one of the most repressive decades in modern American history. For women, too. For women, for blacks, for gays, for everyone who was not a white middle class male. Uh, it was one of the, And think about women, too, who had babies out of wedlock. Whether they were unmarried or teenagers, they were frequently sent to farms to, and their babies given, taken from them and given up for adoption. It was a very repressive era. So when the... The whole force of the United States government and the FBI comes down on your little group uh, of gay men just trying to stress acceptance and raise grassroots awareness. It's very daunting. So the group disbanded, but it quickly reestablished itself. When J. Edgar Hoover uh, began his campaign against these sexual deviates, they started preparing memos. And I've gathered about 320 memos from the FBI from that period in my research. And going through these memos, what I'm seeing is they are gathering information on these members and these attorneys uh, going back to the 1920s wow. even, looking at where they went to college, what ship this, this attorney, what ship did he arrive to America on, what college did he go to, uh, all these things. So it was a very invasive uh, 
uh, investigation that they well, began on these, and, on and, these and, people. And people were frequently refer to McCarthyism and the fact that Joseph McCarthy was trying to ferret out communists. Right. But they quickly put this under that umbrella. They did. They started equating, they were conflating homosexuality with communism. And in fact, when after this executive order went through, um, federal agencies were calling in employees who were suspected of being gay and asking them this almost the same question that they would ask communists. They would say, are you or have you ever been a homosexual? A question that makes no sense to us today. Right. But back then it was very, it was crucial to their employment. Many federal employees were fired as a result of that. Many committed suicide. And one of the men, he was an astronomer who worked for the US government, Frank Kemeny. And Frank, he was fired from his job, but in, he became activist. He said, I'm not going to fall into despair. I'm going to start act, being an activist for gay rights. And he did. In fact, he and a man named Jack Nichols formed the Mattachine Society here in Washington, D.C. in 1961. Uh, so it was, in, in, which is a society that is still in effect. They still really? are operating today. They are. They have a, a website, wow. uh, Mattachine Society, Washington, D.C.org. I wow. think is it. Uh, but it started in 1961 and Frank and Jack Nichols Jr. is an, an interesting case in himself because his father was an FBI agent. Uh, and so his father was aware of his son's uh, gayness and he said, you know, if you want to do this fine, but you have to use a pseudonym. He goes, I'll, his father said he will lose his security clearance right. if, he, uh, uses, if he uses his real name because he was John Nichols Jr. Right, right. So, so when I was doing my research on the underground press, I was finding the name Warren Adkins was popping up a lot. And it was articles about gay rights written by this Warren Adkins. That was Jack Nichols' pseudonym. And what Jack Nichols did, he was also featured in a 1965 documentary hosted by Chris Wallace at 60 Minutes called The Homosexuals. It was the first mainstream documentary on homosexuality that aired on network television. And there was Warren Adkins under his pseudonym as part of it. He also picketed the White House in the early 60s uh, for gay rights. Now think about that. Think of what a bold move that was. When your dad's in the FBI. When your dad's and in the FBI. He and Frank Kameny both were uh, picketing the White House for gay rights in the late 50s, early 60s. So this was, they, were, they were serious about what they were doing. So um, this, th 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 this is a form of suppression and a form of intolerance that goes all the way back to almost 70 years now. That's amazing. And, and the fact that that happened in Washington, D.C., and they were picketing the White House, which I have to tell you, I have not, had never heard of. You know, what people think of as sort of the start of the movement is Stonewall, the Stonewall riots. Right, 1968, exactly. But uh, there was all these things going on leading up to that. Again, there were all these things happening, once again, under the surface, just like with women's liberation and all kinds of, they were, there were people doing things, but they didn't have their voice yet. Stonewall gave the gay rights movement a voice, and that raised awareness more than anything ever had. And right after Stonewall was when the Gay Blade started in DC, the first homosexual magazine uh, here on the East Coast. And that last, that I think is still going on. It is, but it's called the Washington Blade. Right. The one interesting thing, too, about magazines with the gay rights movement, way back in 1953, the Mattachine Society of, of Los Angeles started a magazine called One. The Homosexual Magazine was what it was named. Okay. That's, that's pretty bold. bold. That's bold. To do that. And if you look at this, it was a very conservative, very level, very well written, very well researched publication. Not at all purient or it had no photos or anything like that. And it was just articles about gay awareness. And it was wonderful. It came out the same year Playboy was launched. How about that? But the big difference is the FBI said post office cannot mail this one magazine because it's obscene. Even though there's no pictures in it, no filthy language at all, but because of the topic, homosexuality, they wouldn't allow it to be mailed. Oh, but the post office could bring the Playboy magazine right could into be your mailed. home. Playboy, yeah, Playboy's fine. One cannot. So what happened was the Mattachines sued, and it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, in 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court legalized gay marriage. Very glad to see that. But 1958, the Supreme Court struck the first major victory for the gay rights movement by saying you can't conflate uh, sex and obscenity and you cannot conflate homosexuality with obscenity. 
So they ruled that one could be mailed in the mail. And that was, a, that was huge because most of, their, uh, most of their readership was subscribers. So that was the first major Supreme Court uh, case we ever saw that actually addressed gay rights and they won. And so the magazine was able to be mailed then. So how much did, did having a publication of their own, you know, help to create a network or help other people around the country to know that there were people actively working on broadening their rights or, or working on legal protections? Yeah, unfortunately they were preaching to the choir uh, much of the time. Um, they were still trying to fly under the radar, not trying to be real obvious about what they were doing because ex gay acceptance in the 50s and early 60s just was not there. Well, I mean, think about Rock Hudson. Exactly, just even in 1980. The, I know, I mean, the tragedy, the tragedy of Rock Hudson and the fact that until he was ill with AIDS, the man had lived in the closet, at least yep. for the general public. I'm sure he had people close to him who knew. But that is so sad that a man would subsume and hide his entire life. Right. And just think, so think, and this was 1980, so think what it was like for these guys back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, they, they just simply, they would, they would rather just spread awareness among themselves and work low key like that. So this magazine was being mailed out. You could buy it in bars, you could buy it on some book stands, and the FBI took notice of that. Uh, they were going around to bookstores and these memos that I have, they outlined every bookstore that was selling it. And they knew who was buying it. They were watching them. So it, there's this, it, and it's some of the most boring memos you've ever read because it's just, they're heavily redacted and it's just people talking about, they're just going on about this person bought it, that person bought it, this person looked at it and put it back on the shelf. It just went out, they were just keeping track of all of them like that for years, literally. So it's very boring research because of that. Not only that, it's taxpayers' dollars it's taxpayer having dollars. people sitting around surveying Americans. Exactly right. You know, and I, and, and I think that's the other part of this that, that we really need to be aware of is that this history is conflating homosexuality with being anti-American. Exactly. And when we come back from this break, we're going to talk more about that. And, and I hope everybody stays tuned to understand how we have arrived at a place where we cannot get legal protections for Virginians who are, are LGBT in their place of employment. And the history behind the efforts that have been made all along in this country to try to protect this community. So please join us after the break. Hi, Krista. Take you, Jamie, to be my wife. When we found out that we were pregnant, we were just elated. We were just sitting there waiting for the pediatrician. She said she won't be taking you in as a client. We are a lesbian couple, but she's just a baby. She's the one you're denying the service to. My twin brother Jacob has an autism spectrum disorder. I remember one moment after being at school all day, and I remember him getting into the car just bawling and saying, Mom, I have no friends. Why don't I have any friends? It broke my heart. That was the moment when I realized that I needed to do something about this. I needed to make a difference in his life. And I knew that if I could help him find a friend, I could help teach other people that including people with differences is the right thing to do. That was the inspiration behind my nonprofit score friend. Educating people to include people with differences is so important because when Jacob's included, he feels like he can succeed in life and he feels like he actually has a purpose.
Welcome back to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and joining me today is Dale Brumfield. He is a cultural archaeologist, and the subject we're exploring today is the history of the modern gay rights movement. Thank you so much for being here to shed light on this very interesting topic, Dale. Thanks for having me, Katherine. I appreciate it. So in the federal government, with the federal government shut down and people not being paid, right. you know, it's kind of it's kind of echoes of the fear that that LGBT employees live through because the federal government has never been um, welcoming, inclusive. In fact, it's really kind of a, a system of fear, a culture of fear in the federal government. Right, and think about the fear and uncertainty the federal employees are feeling today, and they're not getting a paycheck this week uh, because of this. But think back to 1953 when the same fear and uncertainty was there for federal employees who were gay or afraid that they were suspected of being gay. They would lose their job because of it. So uh, history does indeed, unfortunately, repeat itself in, the, in, this, in this manner. There was an interesting article, and I think I had posted it, and in, in this is what started this whole discussion, is that um, somebody on Eisenhower's staff was the one who was responsible for this policy, this executive order, and he himself was a closeted gay man. That's, yeah, that's correct. I don't know the whole story behind him, but yeah, he was absolutely a closeted gay man, and it was his job to ferret out uh, the, the, the gays that were within the administration. How shocking and ironic. Uh, no kidding. And you know, it's funny that the, um, the war against communism, the, the McCarthy hearings, the army, and, and these things, those are always up front. Everybody knows of the army McCarthy hearings and the, the House on american Activities Committee and all this, but a similar war, a very similar war was going on against the, the gays, and, and it was, it's, but you never hear about it. No. That's just one thing that's never happened. So that's why it's important that you look at the activities of the Medellin Society and, and read these, this magazine, One, and just see what was really we And that's the only source we have of seeing what really happened in, in those days. So it, it's just a bizarre scenario all around. And, and, and today, here in Virginia, in addition to employment, if somebody suspects that you're gay or transgender, they can refuse to rent you housing. They, you they, know, they can refuse, refuse yeah. public accommodation. They can actually ask you to leave the restaurant or not rent you a hotel room. If they even suspect that you are gay or lesbian, transgender, how have we gotten to a place where we don't see how wrong that is? You know, I, once again, it, it comes down to how slow it is to turn uh, a way of thinking. Um, and it, it, I think there's so much ignorance, especially toward uh, transgender. I have a very good friend in Richmond who's a transgender female, in her 60s years old now, and she told me that growing up there was something wrong, but never could put his finger on what it was back when he, yeah. was, he was living as a he, and uh, attempted suicide, drug abuse, these types of things. Never could figure out what was going on, but it wasn't until this person met Christine Jorgensen yeah. probably the most famous uh, transsexual person of all, they said, you know what's wrong with you. And, and that's when this person said, I do know what's wrong. I was supposed to have been a female. Right. And then now this person lives as a female and is, this, is what, this is what it is. It's hard for people to imagine what someone is going through with that inner turmoil. And so it's educating people about, you know, it, it's possible, you know, it, I know it seems odd, especially in a heavily religious area. And I, you know, I respect religious, religious people and their, and their feelings being one, a Catholic myself. Um, it's a little bit goes at, at odds with what my church teaches, but getting to know someone like this, I see, you know, these are people who were born who literally seem like they've got the wrong body. Right. And it, it really seems that way. And after getting to know this person and several others along the way, saying that's, that's exactly what seems to have happened. You know, we have people born all kinds of different ways. So why isn't this one is, as legitimate as the others? So uh, once we educate and, and try to get people to learn and understand and actually meet uh, gay, lesbian, and transgender people, we can start breaking down the stereotypes and the misconceptions and the ignorance about the lives they're living and just, you know, let them flourish and let them have, you know, it start extending these rights to these people. You know, looking forward in your, with your glasses of a historian on, <laughs> you know, when Bruce Jenner became Caitlyn Jenner. Right. It was one of those inflection points where I think many people never thought such a thing could be possible or that someone would do it 
so publicly. Right. A public figure would do that. Like she transitioned in a very public way. And you look at that now and people actually under, more people understand what transgender is. They know the appropriate term. And I'm thinking, you know, 20 years from now, will a historian look back and say what it really what the turning point was for the public, for our culture was the fact that a high profile respected Olympic athlete publicly transitioned. Right. There was no manlier man than Bruce Jenner. I mean, he was a decathlete for crying out loud, Olympic gold medalist. It doesn't get much more, much more testosterone than that. And then all of a sudden, now, this complete turn into a female. I think, I think you're exactly right. If there was, if there was a tipping point or a, uh, an enlightenment, uh, it might have been the Bruce Jenner case that brings attention to, but it's not gonna be just one that does it. It's gonna be 10 more, at least. So because it's a slow process, a generational process, it's got to come a little bit at a time to turn people's way of thinking. And that's the hardest thing of all. That's the biggest challenge of all is just to change the way people think. Um, but, you know, it's just it's, it's about education. So we just have to keep and not getting angry, respecting other viewpoints and just keep hammering away at your point, hammering away at your points, what I do for a living. And so uh, hopefully, you know, people just start getting the message and, and more people get an agreement then we can do that. But yes, I think the Bruce Jenner point may be the first in a long series of what I think are of uh, enlightening processes that we're going to have to have to raise awareness of this. So from a terms of popular culture, so you're, you focus a lot on history, which is unearthing the things that were and how they relate to where we are. Right. You know, popular books, movies, music, um, celebrities also influence how we think. It influences our the culture we're living in in the right now, the present. Right. 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 So you have movies like um, Boy Erased, and um, that was up for a Golden Globe. And the thing about Boy Erased, it was a movie about conversion therapy. Now this is something we have tried to ban in Virginia. Again, mm -hmm. it's a bill that goes up every year to ban conversion therapy, and every year it's killed in committee. But I think a lot of people go, but I don't even know what it is. And it has nothing to do with me, so why would I care? But then you get this movie. Lucas Hedges, the young actor, was nominated for a Golden Globe. Right. He portrays this young man being put through. Does that change hearts and minds? I mean, is that where we should be looking to help people understand is through things like novels and movies? Well, I hope so. Uh, you know, I hope that there there's a could be many different things that people could look at. Like in, in my own situation, I mean, I have twin sons. One of them is gay. Um, and so that, that says a whole lot about... Um, nurture versus nature. Nurture versus first of all. nature. First of all. Uh, first of all, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that has raised my awareness, certainly. And so something that hits close to home like that, I'm not sure popular culture has a role in that, but I worry about uh, the wrong messages being sent or the wrong inference made from what, what people see. So uh, the more we can bring it home to people and talk to them about people that they know, people that they see every day, uh, that type of thing, I think the pers that personal experience is what's gonna be, have much more uh, influence than, than culture. Uh, like I said, culture has a part, plays a part, it can't be the only part. Because you're right, you know, once you know somebody, you know, I remember uh, Senator Rob Portman was, was very anti-LGBT until his son came out. Right? Then suddenly he was like, well, wait a minute, because it's one thing to be ideologically against something, but when it's your child, suddenly it's not about ideology, it's about changes. your child. Everything changes. Yeah. Like my child should have access to these things. My child should not be discriminated against. My child should not be considered a deviant or less than anybody else's child. Right. And, and you, you want what's best. You want everything that your child should have that any other child should have. Uh, why should y your, your child not be able to get married in the church of their choice? Why should your child not be able to live where they want? You, you want all that for them. So that's when it really, it really drives the point home. And when I look back at the past, like in John Nichols Jr.'s case, you know, his father said, you know, okay, if you want to be like this, be like this. An it's out a, gay man. An out gay man, but you're going to change your name. Right. Otherwise, you're going to screw things up for me. Yeah. You know, but that was, says more of the culture that the father was working in than, than the attitude of the father. So it, I, don't know, I don't know what kind of relationship they had uh, overall. But that, once again, that, that harkens back to the culture in which they worked the, the, and the attitude toward gays that the father could actually suffer because of having a gay son. So that's unfortunate. We really want to see that change. 
and we hope it's changing uh, and hoping what's what's happening here is, is going to do that. We just have to wait and see. And that's, you know, and that's changing hearts and minds, changing people's attitudes is one thing, but there is a role for public policy. You know, we talked about um, marriage equality. You know, right. Equality Virginia worked on that for years and years and years, thinking that we were gonna have to do it in the state of Virginia and would have to be done legislatively. Like that's where our focus was, that's where all our efforts were. We have to get a bill passed. We have to do it in Virginia and suddenly, kind of it came from another direction. It came through the court system, right. not just any court system, the Supreme Court. Right. Suddenly everybody had it. And it's not, it's one of those things where it seemed like it happened all of a sudden. It wasn't all of a sudden. People had been working on it for decades, but it seemed like it was all of a sudden. And now it's okay, not only to be gay, but it's okay to be married and to be out in your same sex partnership, technically and legally. Although there's a lot of people who are still not out in their workplace, in their community, their community of faith, they're not out? Unfortunately, that's still the case. And that's, we have to go all the way back to 1958, to that first Supreme Court case on gay rights, uh, which, which kind of got the ball rolling. Now, it was 61 years ago, for crying out loud. You would think in 61 years we could move a little more faster than this. But again, um, this entrenchment of, of mindset it, it, it has to be turned a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. It's like turning the pages of a book one at a time to get there. Um, but I, I see us going there. It, it's, I just wish it could speed up a little bit. Me too. And I do think that, that just like women's rights, you know, women's equality is based on the fact that we were given the right to vote, right? Exactly. How could equality have happened if, if the government and public policy didn't give us that? Exactly. So it seems to me that people who think that these laws are unnecessary, we don't need legal protections for this community and public accommodation or employment or housing, are missing the point. They cannot be equal unless the public policy grants them certain rights. Exactly. Yeah, the legislative process is so crucial because, we, like I said, we can't leave it up to private enterprise to make these decisions for us. Uh, legislatively, when they can make a decision for us, one that works in our favor, then that will push the private uh, industries into that legislative priority and, and then have to abide by it. Well, I want to thank you very much for being here because well, this has been fascinating for me. It's history that I didn't know a lot of it. Well, But I do think, I do think people need to understand that But this makes a difference about how we should look at what's happening in our legislature today. Correct. And this is what you need to know.